Hey everyone, I'm going to be presenting to you today some of the work that I did during my PhD looking into the neurobiology of bilingualism. And I think that this is a very interesting and important topic because trying to understand how humans process language is one of the main questions that cognitive sciences need to answer. But unfortunately, a lot of the times when people say that they're looking into how humans process language, they actually mean how monolinguals process language. But as it turns out, monolinguals are actually the minority of the population. So in order to create a cohesive and an inclusive account of how humans process language, we need to make sure that we actually understand how multilingual individuals process language and also how individuals who don't process language through speech but sign do so. And so this is where my uh, dissertations place the focus. And the first question that I needed to answer then was, well, what is the language architecture of multilingual individuals. So if we take this to represent the language organization of a monolingual individual, is it the case that bilinguals have this system but essentially doubled such that there are two independent systems with little or no interaction with each other? Or is it the case that they have instead one single unified system that contains elements and structures from both languages and it's all for all intents and purposes the same as or qualitatively the same as that for monolingual individuals? And so in order to answer this question, I turn toward language switching paradigms under the assumption that being able to tell how one goes from one language to another should reveal the underlying structure of each of the representations of each language. And so in trying to look at language switching, I first looked into uh, traditional language switching paradigms, which would place participants in scenarios such as this one, where they were told that if they saw a number or a picture in one color, they should name it in one language. And if it appeared in a different color, they should name it in a different language. And very reliably, what researchers found was that switching languages made people more error prone, it made them slower, and it required increased activity. And specifically, this increased brain activity was located in the anterior and prefrontal regions, heavily associated with cognitive control and cognitive effort. And so the combination of these three results led researchers to conclude that switching languages is effortful. And sort of the theoretical inference from that was that it ought to be the case that these two systems, so the systems for each language, are independent to some extent, and that is what's driving the cause, having to go from one to another. And this follows because if it were the case that there was a single unified system, in principle there would be no reason why picking elements from one language or the other should lead to a cost, as all of them would be part of the same system. But is switching really effortful though? Because I don't know if you are bilingual or if you know people who are, but if you have been around people who are bilingual, you probably have noticed that actually they switch languages pretty often. And it seemed extremely counterintuitive to me that people would switch languages so often if it was in fact such an effortful thing to do. And sort of in my first experiment, I tried to understand, or I said to understand why was the source of this tension between the cost that researchers were finding in the lab and what sort of seemed to me the intuitive experience of a bilingual individual of switching languages effortlessly. So in order to answer this question, I had to find out first what are the situations in which bilinguals switch languages in the real world. And one of these scenarios is the kind of scenario that plays out at NYU Abu Dhabi, where most of the students are fluent in both English and Arabic. And so if you hear conversations between them, they go back and forth very organically and very flawlessly between one language and the other, even within the same sentence. So this is one scenario in which switching languages happen. The other is the one where Hugh Grant is in for weddings at a funeral, where he's speaking with his deaf brother and his uh, English-speaking love interest. And so he needs to go back and forth between sign language and English, depending on who it is that he's interacting with. So this scenario is different from the previous one in that it's no longer the case that the bilingual person can choose freely when to go back and forth between the languages, but actually when to switch is externally imposed upon him by the, inter, the interlocutor's uh, communication skill or the languages that the communicator um, is fluent in. So having identified these scenarios uh, allowed me to answer my first question, or to test my first question rather, which is whether this kind of uh, color cute paradigms that people have draw conclusions from were really capturing what goes on in the real world. And secondly, it also allowed me to answer whether switching in all conversational scenarios is the same. Or in other words, is there something fundamental about switching languages that remains constant regardless of the circumstances surrounding it? 
Or could it be that whether the switch is imposed upon me by who the interlocutor is, as compared to when I'm talking to another bilingual individual and I switch completely voluntarily, could it be that that could cause a difference in the recruited processes? So in order to test this, I placed bilinguals, I placed my bilingual participants in each of these three scenarios. And what I found was that behaviorally, I replicated previous results. And in fact, people were significantly more error prone and significantly slower if they were switching languages when they were following color cues. There was still a cost associated with switching, but it's not, it wasn't quite as significant when people were talking to two monolingual individuals. And what I found was that when a bilingual was communicating with another bilingual, there was no behavioral cost associated with switching languages. And these results were actually also mirrored in our brain data that I collected with MEG. I found a cluster of activity in the prefrontal regions that had been previously identified. And again, I found that this was led by increased activity when people were switching following color cues, a marginal effect when talking to two monolingual individuals. But again, there was no neural evidence that switching languages came with any um, increase of prefrontal activity. So sort of the conclusion from this study was that switching languages is not really inherently effortful, but rather there are certain external circumstances that might make it so. Specifically, switching is only effortful if it's based on external constraints. So given that we know that, then my next question was, okay, then what, what is it that makes it hard? Why is it that if I switch voluntarily, it's totally fine, but there is a cost associated with it if I'm doing it because somebody joins the conversation who doesn't understand the language I was producing up until that point. Or in other words, is what's hard that I need to turn on a language that I wasn't using up until that point? Or is it in the case that having to stop producing what I was producing that is driving this cost? Is turning a language on or turning a language off that's driving this effect? And this is a very difficult question to target because a lot of the time, all these things happen simultaneously. So if I'm speaking English, somebody joins the conversation and I need to go into Spanish, it's going to be the case that I turn on Spanish at the exact same point in which I turn off English. And there isn't really a way to pull these two apart in speech. And so in order to be able to isolate these processes, I turn to a different population, which are bimodal bilinguals. And bimodal bilinguals are people like this woman who can speak and sign at the same time. And not only can they do that, but actually they do that very organically and very commonly in everyday conversations. And so because they're able to speak and sign at the same time, this allowed me to isolate the processes because I could ask them to turn off a language by going from producing both languages to producing just one. And I could also isolate the process of turning on a language because I could ask them to go from producing just one language to producing both of them. And so by doing this, uh, I could answer my question of whether it's turning a language on or off that is driving this activity. And what I found was a cluster of activity, again, in this region. And what I found was that as compared to not switching, so remaining in producing the same language or languages, adding a new language did not require any additional activity and also it did not come associated with any behavioral cost. However, turning a language off or having to stop producing when one had been producing up until that point did elicit significantly more activity. And so the conclusion then was that it's not really turning a language on that's driving an effort, but rather having to turn a language off that is uh, requiring this kind of control. And I also then replicated these results with trilingual uh, individuals further on. So what mechanisms do enable bilinguals to use uh, to control these languages? So now we know that the cost comes from having to follow external constraints for communication, and it specifically comes from having to turn off a language or stop producing something that would otherwise be produced. But what are the mechanisms that are allowing for this to happen? Is it the case that bilinguals develop specialized mechanisms in order to be able to control their languages in this particular way? And some theories had suggested that that was the case. So in order to test that, I designed an experiment in which there was a language switching task and a category switching task. And the idea was to see whether the recruited mechanisms would be the same, whether I was switching languages or I was switching something that was not um, linguistic per se. And the rationale is that if we were to find, uh, if we designed two very, very similar tasks and we found that nevertheless the recruited networks were different, then we would be able to in fact give um, convincing evidence that bilinguals develop a uh, differentiated network in order to be able to control their languages. 
So I designed a task in which participants always saw the exact same stimuli, but in the language switching task, they went back and forth, always naming the numbers, but either naming them in English or in uh, Arabic. And in the category switching task, they always stayed in English and they went back and forth between either naming the number or naming the suit. And what I found was that in both cases, whether bilinguals were switching languages or not, there was the exact same recruitment of the prefrontal regions. And so this has a very interesting consequence, which is a theoretical consequence rather, which is that all of these costs that people have identified before when bilinguals were switching languages don't really seem to be due to switching languages per se, or they don't seem to be intrinsically a part of the language system or indicative of the language architecture, but rather they seem to be an artifact or a consequence of the kind of uh, behavioral task that people have chosen to test them, as shown by the fact that using the same task and not requiring people to switch languages uh, led to the same kind of um, both behavioral and neural results. So this, uh, this result gave us evidence to suggest that there isn't really a language control network, but rather what it seemed to be the case is that we've been testing language which, uh, with tasks that tap on general cognitive control. And regardless of whether it's language that one has to uh, switch between or different semantic categories, the effects are gonna be the same so long as you're forcing participants to control behavior or output following some external cue. So the overall summary that we have them is that language switching following external cues is costly, that these prefrontal networks are actually the same as those involved during general cognitive control, that the cost of switching decreases with more natural cues and in fact fully disappears if we are switching languages voluntarily. So what are the theoretical implications of these findings? Well, I think there are um, at least two. The first one pertains to the bilingual advantage, which is a theory that has been heavily and heavily debated in the last uh, decade or so in the field. We suggest that as a consequence of having to constantly control two languages, uh, bilinguals become better in general cognitive control as well. And given the evidence that we've just reviewed, um, it seemed to me that it could be the case that the premise holds for people who spend a lot of the time in an environment where they need to control languages following external stimuli, but it doesn't really follow for people who live and spend most of the time in a bilingual environment. The reason being that if I'm in a bilingual environment, I'm free to choose either language at any point in time. As we saw, there isn't really any recruitment of this um, cognitive control network, and so there is no reason to believe that there is any additional training that could subsequently lead to an advantage. However, if I spend most of my time in this kind of two monolingual environment, one could make the argument that I am training more of these networks because I'm always controlling behavior in that manner, and so perhaps there could be room for uh, an advantage to emerge later down the line. Um, okay, so this is the first theoretical advantage that, uh, sorry, theoretical implication that one can derive from the empirical findings. And the second, and I think the most relevant one, pertains the original question that I said I was uh, set to answer, which is, what is the language architecture of the bilingual mind? And as I said before, the argument had been in favor of some sort of distinct uh, system for each of the languages, but this re these proposals were based on the erroneous um, assigning of the cost that people have seen to the language process and the language network per se. But now that we know that they weren't really part of the language system, but rather they were a consequence of the behavioral task, and that we know that when somebody is switching completely voluntarily, there isn't really any kind of discourse, then it would make sense to propose instead a mechanism that contains both of the languages and that it can flawlessly and effortlessly go back and forth between the two languages. And I developed a whole framework as to what the parameters and rules for this kind of uh, mechanism would be. Um, and you're welcome to read more about them, uh, about it, uh, or ask me about it if you have any questions. Um, so with this, I want to conclude thanking all of my supervisors, my collaborators, and my lab mates uh, that helped me conduct all of this research. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to, to ask them now. Thank you.